Barack Obama, declaring an end to the financial crisis. Also talking about it's time for Americans to turn the page. Here's a little of what we heard from the president. Now, this effort will take time. It will require focus. But we will succeed. And tonight, I call on this Congress to show the world that we are united in this mission by passing a resolution to authorize the use of force against ISIL. We need that authority. It's worth noting it was a speech that was not short on applause, but what's the underlying tones and intent? We welcome to the studio Matthew W. Barzen, who's American ambassador to the UK. Thank you for coming in, Mr. Ambassador. Welcome to the show. Thank um, you for having me. Please call me Matthew. Now that you've said that, Matthew, I shall. Thank you for that. Um, turn the page, to quote the president directly. What does he mean by that, Matthew? Well, I think he means that we've gone, um, in the six years he's been president, from rescue mode to recovery mode as it relates to our uh, economy. And now we're in this resurgence with job growth and the other impressive numbers he stated. Um, and it is time to um, take it to the next step and to expand uh, the economy for the middle class. And I think it's worth noting, just because it's one of those examples where British English and American English are a little different. So when we say middle class in America, it's just worth all the listeners remembering that 80%, 80% of Americans self-identify as middle class. So when he uses that phrase, that's what he means. Okay. Um, what is the resurgence down to, and how does it next manifest itself in the U.S., would you say? Well, I think you're seeing things like GDP growth, but the president's always been clear, and he talked about this when he was running for president for the first time, that that's not how he measures success. He measures it in terms of what it actually means for working families. And so we've seen good signs of actual wages going up. That's an important metric. But we got to keep on doing this. We have to invest in infrastructure. We have to keep investing in an open and free internet. All these things that will pay off, not just in the few years ahead, in his remaining two years, but for decades to come. How has uh, America changed in the view of the world on Obama's watch? I mean, in terms of how the rest of the world sees yeah, the sees United the States? Well, it does get to the second thrust of his speech. First was about middle class economics. The second part, I think, was about American leadership around the world. And I would think of it as leadership, partnership, and stewardship, and no closer partner than the UK in that. Leadership meaning you look at the problems around the world, Ebola, ISIL, Russian aggression in Ukraine, climate to name four that the president talked about last night. All of those, A, require American leadership. B, America can't do it alone. We have to work with partners. And then C, they all require that we act uh, together, we act right now, and we act with all the tools we have. Has he delivered on his promises those years ago? Absolutely. I mean, I think back to all the stump speeches I heard when I worked for him in 2007, 2008. You were 2008. very close to just to remind the listeners you worked very closely with him. I president. worked closely on the campaign and um, from my home state of Kentucky. And the things he said then about domestic policy and his priorities about growing our economy from the middle out... And as it relates to foreign policy of saying, let's work with other countries, let's partner up, um, because if we aren't perceived as living up to our values, it won't make us safer. Yeah, and talking about being safe and talking obviously leads us into terrorism. You have to say, Matthew, um, he did say that he would close Guantanamo Bay. It's he, still open for business. Exactly. And he touched on this um, last night in the speech. I think it was in his first... 36 hours as president, he signed the executive order. And he did it because he said, it is not making us safer. It's It flies in the face of all these values we talk about, stand up for, believe. But why is it still And it's a great recruiting tool for the bad guys who want to do us harm. So this, um, uh, so he tried to do it. He has cut in half the population of Guantanamo Bay since his time, but there's more work to be done. He talked about that. He's committed to doing it by the time he leaves office. Uh, and and now, the really, reason, and do I don't you... want to bore the listener, but I mean, he's run into real congressional, and that was yes. part of his audience last night, talking to Congress that put up a bunch of roadblocks preventing him from um, following through on that mission, but he's not giving up on that. Isn't that the reality of last night, though? Whatever his words, whatever support people might have, he's got that roadblock ahead of him, almost anything he tries to attempt. Explain to the listeners how difficult that is for a U.S. president. Well, yes, exactly. Unlike a parliamentary system here, where sort of by definition, if you formed a government, presumably you have the votes to get your uh, your most, priorities Most passed. times you do. Yeah, most <laughs> times. Most times. Uh, in our system, of course, it, it doesn't work that way. And it, it's important to note, it was designed not to work that way. It was designed to be slow. It was designed to be contentious. Um, 
not to shut down or, or some of the things we've seen recently. That's not normal. It's not designed to do that. But it's going to be contentious. And you think about what he's done on health care reform, what he's done on the economy. All of these things have been a fight is, and a struggle of ideas. And he welcomes that struggle. That's how our system works. We, and compromise is a key part of it, that you stick up for what you believe, he doesn't agree with everything, and then you try to come to a compromise. If we were sitting in New York, would I be deluged with calls of people supporting his health care plan, Matthew? Well, let me talk about... Uh, it has been... Div- is it fair to say it's been a degree divisive? Oh, it absolutely has. I mean, there's interesting... Uh, Kentucky, which is home for me, uh, and I'll get the numbers sort of vaguely right, if you ask people, what do you think about Obamacare... Uh, and that word has been very, um, you know, publicized for people mostly against it and then for it, um, it will not get very high approval ratings. If you ask the same group of people, do you like KY Connect, which is Obamacare as it manifests, in, itself, as it manifests yeah. itself in Kentucky, you see the opposite is true. People really like it. Ten million people are getting coverage in the United States who didn't have it before. They like that. They like the benefits of it. But the name has become quite contentious. What might we have seen with an unfettered President Obama? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I don't... As he system... comes, as he walks out, he's going to think, gee, it's been amazing. I'll never forget this, but I wish I'd... Well, I think you're seeing it right now, and I think you saw it in the speech last night. Um, there's work still to be done. I mean, the, um, you know, good signs recently on wages, but that has to continue because you cannot have a situation, and this is why he ran for president, that the country was getting richer, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't going to working families who were trying really hard, and healthcare costs were going up, energy costs were going up, the cost of education were going up. So you weren't getting a raise, and those costs were going up. And so he said, let's do things to get wages up: minimum wage, fair pay, women getting paid the same amount as men, other moves to uh, to get that up and to control the costs. And you saw that with healthcare. His announcement that community college ought to be free and his all of the above energy strategy, which has had a real impact, uh, not only on the climate, but on uh, everyone's pocketbook. Sadly, something that unites our two great nations is the fight against terror. Where does the president stand on that? And how active is it? How vigilant do you have to be? Do the US have to be? Does the UK have to be? And indeed, jointly, do we have to be? Very, very vigilant. You heard him talk about that last night reconfirm his commitment to not only protect the American people, but stand with our allies and partners in their fight against terrorism. How is ISIL From be- Pakistan to Paris, and sadly, lots of other people. London's felt it. Uh, we've felt it as a country, um, and we need to... Um, we've got to remain vigilant on it. How is ISIL to be defeated? Well, you see it right now <clears throat> with a broad coalition, including Arab countries, um, addressing the problem. Of course, there's a military component, and it's not limited to military. You've got the military component. You've got to stop the flow of foreign fighters. You've got to stop the flow of funding. You've got to stop the flow of fanaticism. And while you do all of that hard, important work, you have to make sure that the humanitarian issues are dealt with, both on the, um, especially on the Syrian side. And you see the United States and the United Kingdom in all of those lines of effort I just ran through working together to make that happen. Um, what's it like being a traveling diplomat, particularly for your family? Uh, the family enjoys it. We got to do this once before in Sweden. How long were you based in Sweden? We had two years in Sweden. And then I went back to go help with the president's re-election campaign. It is a complete honor and joy to wake up every day, see that American flag flying, and go to work um, for our country. Okay. Um, Britons and Americans get on well. I think so. We're all very friendly. But there is a school of thought that you ask guys, you owe us guys some money as regards the congestion charge. And I'm going to move back to Mr. Ambassador. Oh, the Ambassador. congestion tax. The congestion charge, Mr. Ambassador. Tax. Well, we call it a charge. i got a figure here of £9,390,280 currently owed by the US Embassy. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. £9 million for cash or your checkbook now. <laughs> what Nick, do you say, I, I love Mr. Your, Ambassador? I love your deal-making spirit. Yeah. Uh, no, look, it is, it is a tax. And it's worth saying because this does get... I think confused and it gets conflated with something and and someone stopped me the other day and said I heard you guys don't pay your parking tickets and it's like hey look we pay all our parking tickets this particular issue and we're not alone there's I think 56 other uh, embassies here in London who don't do it because we had an agreement with each other coming out of the Vienna Convention where we said look we aren't businesses right these diplomatic academies countries can afford to have big missions we're building a huge 10-story thing across the river uh, in Wandsworth And the reason we're able to make these investments and other countries are able to make investments in other capital cities is because we treat them specially. We treat them 
um, not as businesses and therefore not subject to the same tax as businesses would be. So that's why we don't pay the congestion tax. And let me reiterate, it really is a tax, and that's why we don't. See, here's the thing that I don't understand. There are more than 56,000 penalty charges to the U.S. Embassy outstanding. 41 charges have been paid, presumably by individual members of staff. So some guys there are paying. Uh, I think the 41 were just early on as the tax rolled out. The charge. I, I'm telling you, it's a tax. I mean, we can look, we can have, uh, right. we can have a good debate. Okay. I guess we are having a good debate. All right, debate. what about nine point, what about 8.5 for cash? If I bring it down from 9.3, could we, could we, what about if we do a deal there? Boris would be so, ha- Boris Johnson would be so happy with me if I could get that money out of you. What do you say? Oh, are you, uh, no, I think it's, look, I think the right thing to focus on is the fact that we are building a new embassy across the river. We are doubling down on this special relationship because you think of all the work that the U.S. and the U.K. do together all around the world to make ourselves more prosperous, more safe, more just. That's a really good thing. Thank you so much for coming along. I thank look you forward so to seeing you again. And thank you for giving some of the background to what the president has said. And enjoy your, uh, your time here. Good luck with the Cheers. family. Thank Thanks, you. Nick. That's the American ambassador here to the UK. That's Matthew W. Buzz. And coming up after a quick time report, the Chilcot response has now, Chilcot letter has now been put out. Uh, this The Chilcot letter from the number 10 has gone. And now this is the response I've just been handed, is it? Is that right? This is what's just been handed to me? What John? This is what John Kills, this is what Sir John is saying? Yes. Right, the response coming up, what Sir John says in reply to that after some travel. 9.47. I'm Chris Golds in the LBC Travel Centre. Still no change on the A13. Remains closed in both directions between the two slip roads.